Good, good, af good afternoon, everybody, uh, and a very, very warm welcome to this, afternoon, uh, this afternoon's event. Um, we are the Poverty and Education Network from the Scottish Educational Research Association. Uh, this is the first of uh, a number of events. Um, we're going to have three, at least three events before the summer. Um, but the first two events, we're going to be highlighting recent research into poverty and education. Uh, the, the event is going to be recorded, so if you don't want yourself to be visible, please turn off your camera. Could I also ask people to turn off their microphones while the speakers are speaking? Now, quite a packed programme. We've only got an hour. We have five short inputs of five minutes. At the end of each short input, we will have five minutes for comments, reactions, questions, and at the end, we'll have an open discussion. Now, we have quite a number of people uh, participating today. So if you would put your questions, comments in the chat function, please, and I'll pick them up and I'll direct them to the speakers. So we're very grateful for that. With great pleasure, we introduce the first, first speaker, Clara Piri from the um, Caledonian University. And she's going to talk about new insights into poverty and education during the COVID times. Clara. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, I will just share my screen. Does that all look okay? Yep. Great, and um, so thank you so much to um, the association for having me. As Stephen has just introduced, my name's Clara Piddy, and I work at the Scottish Poverty and Inequality Research Unit along with John McKendrick, who you'll be hearing from shortly. Um, so really the purpose of this short presentation is to give a brief overview of some of the evidence into poverty and education over the last uh, 12 months, over this kind of COVID period. So naturally there will be some omissions, um, and some of this might be familiar to you, but I think they're particularly relevant given the context um, and full references um, will be provided um, at the end. So one of the kind of key areas um, that has been researched over the past while um, is the idea of attainment of the attainment gap, equity and equity and the impact of COVID-19 on these. So back in summer, Barry Black of the University of Glasgow published a policy and research briefing looking at attainment and disadvantage in Scotland schools. And um, so these are a lot of ideas that I'm sure many practitioners and researchers were kind of uh, grappling with at the time, but it was a really nice concise way of, of kind of bringing that to the attention of a lot of people. And then more recently, Robertson and McCarty of the Poverty Alliance published um, the Poverty Related Attainment Gap Review of the Evidence. So drawing on um, existing evidence, looking at, at that specifically, um, they kind of also concluded that COVID was likely to compound already uh, start gaps um, in educational attainment as well. Then the Scottish Government themselves published their equity audit, so looking at the impact of building closures on equity specifically. Um, so that drew on existing evidence as well as a host of new evidence from across Scotland um, and had some interesting findings. So they uh, raised some potential issues such as the impact on children's development, um, on mental health and wellbeing amongst others, uh, particularly for more vulnerable um, and disadvantaged groups. Um, and then also recently, McGee and Rush Marsh of Celsius, so the Centre for Excellence for Children's Care and Protection, published a report looking at the digital divide. So this idea of digital exclusion, which came up in a lot of the research, and I believe will be covered at one of the, the other of these webinars, um, but specifically for care experienced young people in Scotland. So a group that we know already experienced very particular um, kind of barriers um, and inequalities. So another really interesting read. Um, as well as this, these ideas of equity and attainment, food and poverty um, were, were obviously issues that, that came up often in the research. So Child Poverty Action Group, building on their cost of the school day work, produced a report in 2020 looking at the cost of learning in lockdown. So although that was a UK-wide piece of work, it also included new research from Scotland, looking at some of the, the kind of hidden barriers that families were experiencing um, in relation to lockdown, uh, despite the, the best intentions of 
many teachers, I'm sure. Sorry, a wee bit of feedback there. Um, and food was one of the, the kind of key issues that came out of this as well. Um, we then had some reports looking at the idea of food insecurity, specifically in schools, which is obviously quite a topical issue. Um, Marcus Rashford became a bit of a spokesperson for, for free school meals. Um, but um, the report from McKendrick from John and um, looking at school meals and catering leads is, is a really interesting read. Um, and I think John will be speaking to some of this work shortly. Um, and also from McKendrick and Kith Cart, we had a report looking at food insecurity in Scottish schools um, in the context of declining free school meals uptake. Um, so they produced some kind of case studies that looked at uh, schools which were kind of bucking that trend. So again, really interesting. So although COVID very much um, was the focus of a lot of research over the past wee while, there was definitely still scope to kind of look forward and look into the longer term. Um, so Scotland's Futures Forum, which is the Scottish Parliament's think tank, produced uh, Scotland 2030 Future Schooling, Education and Learning. Um, so that brought together views from kind of a lot of experts, but importantly children and young people through uh, forums such as uh, Young Scot and the Children's Parliament, etc. Uh, to pro provide a bit of a scenario or a vision uh, about what Scottish education might look like in 2030. Um, so very thought provoking and I'm sure not everyone will agree with what that vision is but I think that's kind of um, the point of it. Um, and finally the Commission on School Reform and their submission to the OECD Review of Curriculum for Excellence um, called for an overhaul of CFE of Curriculum for Excellence um, citing among others uh, narrowing of the curriculum in S4 and a flawed implementation of, of CFE. So um, in conclusion, uh, although it's been a very busy year for a, a lot of other reasons, it's certainly been a busy year in terms of research um, and hopefully a lot of this can kind of start to inform the, the COVID recovery as well. So thank you. I hope that was under five minutes, Stephen. It was perfect, Clara. Perfect. <laughs> and if you could just stop sharing your screen, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, any comments or questions for Clara before we move on to John McKendrick? No, might, might be better to move on to John and then we could maybe get um, combined comments about both. Clara, that was really very helpful, very interesting stuff. Um, I think uh, I'm going to I'm going to preempt one of the questions. We will be able to get those slides, yes? Yeah, of course, yep. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Thanks very much. So. I'm going now to introduce our second speaker, also from Glasgow Caledonian University, a very, very well known um, uh, researcher, Professor John McKendrick. And John, John's been doing uh, a lot of work on school food learning lessons from a crisis. And I'll share the screen, John. There we go. Yeah, do I have control over the slide, Stephen? I have, unfortunately. So just that's no me. problem. Uh, can I just click my fingers? That work okay? Is that what you did on on the football part, John? <laughs> just for you, Stephen. Just for you. Do you want to move oh, on? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Maestro. Uh, thanks very much for for coming along. Uh, as Clara's introduced, it's been a very busy year in terms of research on education related to COVID issues, and the issue that, that we're talking about this afternoon, specifically about school food which might not seem the most important issue in the grand scheme of things, but as Clara pointed out, it's very much been a headline issue over the last years with the interventions of Marcus Rashford, uh, encouraging uh, the, the UK government to, to think about the extension of the equivalent of school food provision in the holiday period. But there are many other reasons why we as a network and a, and a body of people interested in poverty and education should be thinking about school food. Uh, last week, and it was literally last week, the World Health Organization uh, published their, their most recent state of school feeding worldwide. So it's a worldwide issue, not just an issue to do here with Scotland. It's a national priority here in Scotland, school food. The school meals is one of the uh, ways in which we uh, are a target we've set ourselves in terms of Scotland's anti-poverty strategy to increase the number of children eligible for school meals that actually present for it. Uh, Two weeks ago in Scotland, we had the publication of Healthy Eating in Schools, the 2020 guidance about the, the nutrition standards in Scottish schools that are expected and required. Uh, we can look back and think about food over the COVID times, but I think we also want to look forward because there's a lot of political promises uh, have been made regarding school food, and this is an election year, 
So it's something that's going to be on the agenda over the, new f- the next few weeks as well. Uh, could you move on, please, Stephen? I'm yeah. loving this. I'm loving telling you what to do. This is wonderful. Not for long, brother. Not for uh, long. So, and this is a problem, as Clara pointed out. The uptake of free, free school meals um, is universal for P1 to P3, as we know. Uh, after that, eligibility uh, is universal in Glasgow for P4, but elsewhere it's uh, and, and elsewhere and beyond P4, it's based on passported benefits. And over the last four years, the proportion in Scotland as a whole of children entitled to free school meals who have taken that through free school meals has fallen slightly. So the direction of travel is negative, despite the fact that the Scottish government have it as an indicator of one of the anti-poverty indicators. So we have a problem. Free school meals is not doing what we want it to do. If we could move on again, please, Stephen. Yep, there we go. But this year has been an interesting year and there's been a lot of innovations in the delivery of, of school meals or the school meal service in Scottish schools. Uh, carts has something that's um, emerged on the agenda, breakfast carts rather than breakfast clubs. Breakfast carts are interesting because they have more flexibility than a breakfast club in terms of providing morning food. Uh, carts that simply make food freely available for children, any child can help themselves to it. And there's some work that we, we undertook some work with the Greggs Foundation in East Renfrewshire, but there's more interest in this generally about whether this is a way forward in terms of providing start of the day food for children. Uh, that work in case studies of promising practice have, have shown that a lot of schools are now doing what they said last year they couldn't do. So, for example, staggered lunch breaks is, is featured in a number of Scottish schools, whereas head teachers told us last year we simply can't do that. And the staggered lunch breaks are quite important because the Scottish school estate doesn't really allow for all children in secondary schools in particular to have a school meal at the same time. So there simply isn't the capacity in the Scottish schools now to, to handle school meals. Staggered lunch breaks make that more possible. We were told it wasn't possible. It has been possible in COVID times. It's shaken things up a little bit. And it's bright, bringing that wider world to the schools. Another example that we've seen in some of these innovations of good practice. So some of the schools then have, have tried to replicate the street food experience within the school. Having a caravan, for example, in the school grounds that is, is, is giving street food out to children or replicating some of the more popular foods out there that we don't associate with, with the school palate, uh, but presenting that as part of the school day. And some of the innovations are interesting and this will bring me on to the, con- the concluding slide, conclusion points. So there, there's a tension between do what you're told or what do you want in terms of how we deal with children. Mm-hmm. If I could just move on to the, the last slide. And these are some reflections that regard the big issues to do with school food. I think we have to think about the connections between schools and their communities. And there is this tension about whether trying to remove children from their communities at lunchtime is consistent with that broader view we have of schools as being part of the communities. Um, it's interesting school food actually tries in some ways to pull, pull them apart and break that relationship. I think we want to think about what the purpose of school food is. Is it about care? or is it about nutrition? And we might argue the way in which school food is delivered is every bit as important as nutrition. Uh, and that's got implications for what the school meal service is. Children's rights is an interesting issue as well. So that one of the schools I referred to simply stopped children being able to leave the school grounds at lunchtime. Uh, S1 and S2 were not allowed to leave the school grounds. And that had a quite significant impact on the uptake of, of school meals. But that's kind of inconsistent with where Scotland is going in terms of uh, children's rights and giving children the right to articulate their opinion and, and shape services. So I think there's tensions in, in regard to children's rights and, and school food. Uh, nutrition, performance and engagement are issues that we don't know. We kind of think that if children are better fed in the morning, it means they will perform better or they'll engage better in learning. But I think we need more evidence to really uh, properly assert that point. Cash first futures. Uh, is interesting because a lot of the ways in which local authorities responded to the challenge of providing the equivalent of a free school meal when we were in lockdown was to provide money to families. And that's really significant because that's a bigger debate about what welfare is and how welfare should be provided. 30 of the 32 authorities in Scotland provided a cash equivalent of school food. Two authorities provided a food package. And that, I think, is a, a broader debate. And finally, I think that universalist futures. I mean, what is it we, we, we want as a country? that I think education in terms of school food is asking us to think about. P1 to P3 universal provision we've had for a few years. A couple of the political parties from very different sides of the political spectrum are offering that now uh, universal provision of, of free lunchtime food uh, in the primary schools as an offer going forward. And it's again, it's I, I think it's a bigger issue for the country as a whole. So I'll leave it there, Stephen. Lots for us to think about is a conclusion I'm making, but it's certainly an issue that we in poverty and education groups should be thinking about. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. Now, we've, we've got a question from Sue Ellis. Sue, 
Do you want me to read it out or do you want to read it yourself? You read it. Okay, so Sue, Sue John is asking, any data on the quality of school meals? Are there variations in the average cost across local authorities, school sectors? Yeah, the, the, yeah, hi Sue, nice to hear from you again. The, the, there is excellent information actually collected, corrected by the sector. There are two organisations in Scotland that gather this information routinely. There's Assist FM, Assist Facilities Management. Uh, their annual webinar is next week for the sector. And there's also APSI, uh, the Association of Public Service Excellence, that actually do a, a collection of that nuts and bolts information of the school meal service. APSI doesn't quite have a universal coverage in Scotland, but it allows us to answer these questions. In, in terms of quality and nutrition, there should be no problem because every Scottish school is required to deliver food according to the nutrition standards that were legislated for last year in 2020 and the guidance was pr uh, produced two weeks ago of healthy eating in schools. One of the challenges schools are facing is the ability to do that in these COVID times in terms of supply chains. So there is, a, there is you know, the supply chain issues in terms of, of delivering what's required, but there should not be any reason why any food that's provided in schools doesn't meet very stringent nutritional standards. And I think another point to note, Sue, it's not just school lunchtime, it talks about the whole school day. So the approach to school and the, the nutrition standards also apply to breakfast food. So I'll give a concrete example, that breakfast cart initiative we did in East Renfrewshire schools, many of the cornflakes and Weetabixes that I eat for my breakfast were not allowed to be provided for in that initiative because they didn't meet the stringent standards for nutrition, which may be another issue because if we're interested in putting food in the stomachs, but our uh, nutrition standards are overly stringent and are maybe not providing what children want, we have to ask whether or not all our goals have been met. So it's a, it's a balancing act there, but there's no, no reason for poor quality. Thanks, Thanks Sue. Some, some good. Sue, do you want to respond? Are you happy with that? I'm happy. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, the, there are no more questions or, or comments, so we'll move on because we are chasing the clock here. Uh, our third input comes from Alistair Wilson from the University of Strathclyde. Uh, the title is Challenging Educational Inequality, Move the Focus from Schools to Communities, question mark. Alistair. You need to unmute. Okay, can I share my screen? Uh, hang on. Should be able to now. Okay, everybody see that? Yep. Okay, so a uh, quick five minutes then. Um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, how we're addressing educational inequality at the moment um, and sort of where we are at the moment and, and sort of push that towards looking uh, to work more within communities. The work that I'm going to talk about has been carried out at Strathclyde University, largely by myself, Alistair Wilson, um, and Katie Hunter, my colleague who I think is here as well. Um, so I want to base it, what I'm going to say around uh, three, what I think are key questions. What, what do we actually know at the moment about education and equality? Um, what are the things that we seem to be choosing to ignore? Um, and then I want to round that off by saying what I think you know, we can do in the future. I should say that all this isn't just a, an idle rant. It's based on some of the research that we've done over the last number of years in widening participation, some work on literacy development in children, uh, with Sue Ellis, who's here, and also with Sue and, and colleagues' work that we've done in um, looking at pupil, pupil Equity Fund and Scottish Achievement Challenge Fund and how it's been spent within local authorities. Okay, so what do we know? Um, inequality in educational outcomes is not decreasing, it's not going away, it's not uh, fading in any way, and as we've just heard, probably with COVID-related issues, we're probably going to see an increase in inequality. Um, and educational outcomes in particular. Um, what we also know is that school-based and, and led interventions, if you like, are not largely in the research seen as being particularly impactful. Uh, and they're certainly not considered cons significant um, in terms of affecting the sort of change of scale 
that we're, we're experiencing in Scotland and, and is, is required in Scotland. And part of that for me is how we conceptualize um, sort of interventions and how to address this problem. We're very much in the kind of language and workings of interventions, scaling up uh, what works, what doesn't work. And from my point of view, I think that creates a kind of almost mythical situation that somehow sooner or later we'll come up with some magic formula or an equation that solves everything. Um, I think that's not a useful way of approaching this problem. We're not going to get that type of evidence in anywhere near the quantities that you know, would make it usable. And ultimately, I would see it, see it as quite a sort of positivist, actually impossible endeavor. But we do have a deeper understanding of how inequality is, um, is created. Um, it, it is available to us. We do have arguments about social class. Uh, guys like Mike Savage, sociologist, has done a lot of work on social class in the UK. And we know from that type of work and other work that, you know, who people know, their connections, who they've got access to, what we would talk about in terms of the power of social and cultural capital. I mean, this is understood and known. It, it shows us the mechanisms by how uh, inequality gets created. And it does give us room to start and address them. And for me, education is a completely, obviously, a social experience, but so is inequality. And we've got to see inequality in a different way. And for me, it's about seeing it as something that permeates our communities, permeates institutions. Um, and sometimes that's very visible, the mechanisms by which that occurs. Other times it's quite implicit. Uh, it's not visible. So there are things we know and there's things that we can act on. Okay, what, what would I say we, we ignore? Well, the extent of inequality, I think the unfairness of it and the dominance of privilege are things we completely ignore. Um, some work we've done recently, if you look at local school websites, uh, access to the professions, use of UK CAT test, all things we have covered in our research, completely unfair if you come um, from what I would call a, a more working class or a poor background. I think we also ignore the role played by institutions in maintaining inequality. And certainly in the work we've done, um, issues around social class bias are quite implicit. Um, and they're things that I would say if they were made more conspicuous, you know, and viewed from a sort of race, race or ethnicity perspective, we'd, we'd see as being completely unacceptable. Um, I think we also ignore the role of communities as fundamental in their, to nurturing education. Um, you know, if you look at the community at the moment, uh, somewhere in Scotland where there's very, very few children and young people making this sort of a progress we would expect, sort of attainment. There's hardly any of them going into any of the more competitive professions, whole communities where we don't create doctors, lawyers, teachers, etc. You know, that focus is, of the community is being a, a group of people, a location, um, and, you know, that you can grow up and be in that community without any of those things ever being possible in terms of career. So I think there's a, you know, really ignoring of communities as a focal point for this. Um, I think we also, and this is one of the real bugbear with me, we, um, well, they're all problems, but this one in particular as a researcher, we, all, we, we really ignore our potential to affect change. And what we see in Scotland in particular is an emphasis on buying in projects, on buying in interventions, getting off the, off the shelf solution, and from my point of view, we don't really nurture our own innovation. We don't nurture um, sort of interventions or, or actions, if you like, projects that are developed in Scotland for Scottish contexts. Let's see what we can learn and move forward. We don't do that. So we ignore um, what we could do ourselves. And to, find, to sort of finish on that side, we, we ignore the children and young people, their families and communities. Um, and not only do we ignore them, but I would argue we establish them as being lacking. We establish them as part of the problem. They don't have enough information. Uh, some more aggressive research will say they don't have enough ambition, confidence, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what can we do? I mean, I think for me, um, the work we've done, we need to imagine a different world. Um, and I think, you know, thinking about um, Scotland as somewhere different, thinking about it as a place that people actually might come to to see how we uh, addressed inequality and the damage we've done to it and the way we've created a different place. Um, we're, we're, as I said earlier, we're buying things, we'll travel the world looking for a solution. You know, let's make Scotland somewhere where people come to. I think we need to be pragmatic and that's about stopping using these kind of, you know, imported solutions, investing in our own learning systems, processes, think about our own teachers, community and young people and work from there up and try and find solutions. 
And for me, that's got to be around a model of research that's based on innovation. Um, so let's research, innovate, research, innovative, you know, get something iterative going uh, and learn from what we develop. And that's something that, you know, we don't see at the moment. You don't see explicit funding of pilot projects, et cetera. Um, and, and again, acknowledge the nurture and role of communities in affecting change. Um, for me, the, the school-based focus is weak. Um, we need to work within a community, help that community change, have a plan for how that community might look different in five years' time. And we can see even when, when John has referred to, to something like school meals, or, you know, isolating that from the community causes problems. Okay, so finally, just quick, what are we doing about it? Um, you know, we're involved in, in different bits of research, looking at, at, at mentoring that's based on ideas around social cultural capital. We're doing literacy work with, with Bernardo's, again, doing some work with local authority, um, looking at how they're spending money, the impact of PEF and so on. And then all that work, I would argue that we're really up against the sort of notions of what con was considered kind of robust, reliable evidence. You know, this kind of toolkit approach and the sort of what works kind of baseline, you know, introducing interventions, scaling them up, all that language, I think, causes us problems when we really try to tackle inequality in communities. Okay, is that me, Stephen, within five yeah. minutes? Yeah, if you could stop sharing the, the, the screen, that'd be great. And um, we've, got, we've got a question from um, Tracy Robbie. Hi, thanks, John, and thanks, Alistair. I'm scared to talk here because I'm just a wee PhD student but I'm doing one about, um, and my findings are that there's a huge gap between the, the, the schools, the high schools that I've interviewed pr practitioners at, between um, what they're doing with their PEF money and a complete sort of lack of awareness. They don't seem to join the dots that when I was asking them, what do you personally do to support disadvantaged children? It's completely different and it's nothing to do with the PEF money. It's nothing to do with the inputs on literature and numeracy. It's about whole school approaches, positive relationships, and they don't seem to twig that it's that more human community based. And the second part of my uh, study is looking at youth workers on, and other partners, I'm sure, that can link between school and community. So my, uh, sorry to go on, my last thing I'm gonna say, my thing is finding that because things like the guidelines for PEF are very strict, you can't use innovative approaches that we're, Alistair saying is, would characterize something that would actually be effective. They're, they're hobbled by this need to um, adhere to the guidance that requires them to only use evidenced inputs. And it's almost like school systems are a, a cage that, doesn't allow them to do what they, as a human being, they know, but they don't quite have awareness of, that could actually make a difference. Thank you for letting me speak, I'm shaking. No, that's that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, Alistair, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you've covered a, a lot of the really kind of difficult issues that we have with all this. I think that um, putting pressure on schools to spend the money and show impact is, is really problematic. I think schools will use the money in ways that address inequality that don't immediately look as if they're going to make a change in literacy or numeracy. Um, one head teacher I've worked with spent the money in, in buying in very expensive counselling for families um, on the basis that that's work she has to do. And if she doesn't do it, it, um, it causes a lot more difficulty. So to free up her time to be a head teacher and actually address inequality in literacy and numeracy and so on, she was buying in support. So I think the framework we've given schools to work within is very narrow. I think the other thing to say is that if you force them to work in that narrow way and you know, you're know you asking them to look for these type of interventions, to look at the education endowment toolkit, things like that, which are largely you know problematic. I mean, from my point of view, and I've, I've had a lot of discussion with the guys in the Education Endowment Foundation, it's not, um, it's not fully ready. It's not something we can refer to. It's designed to be international. They see it as being something that's growing. So even when you point teachers towards sources of where they might look for interventions, it's hugely difficult for them to implement them. I'm, I'm, I've got another question. I'm going to ask John and Clara to answer this one, even though it might appear to be more appropriate to Alistair. Um, from David Watt, given the reduced attendance from children in the most deprived areas over the past five years, 
Why do we keep doing the same approaches? John, mute. You're muted. Yeah, I'll, I'll have a stab at that. Yeah, no, I'll be honest, and I'm embarrassed, David. Um, hi, David. That I, I didn't know that attendance uh, was um, was de decreasing over the last five years. What what I can certainly say with regard to school food is that that's an area where we're not doing the same thing. There's quite a lot of innovation, quite a lot of local innovation, and innovation that comes both from the catering side and from the educational side. So there's lots of, and I wouldn't say it's good practice because I don't think we, it's evaluated and we should put that label on it, but there's lots of promising practice within school meals. And that's an active professional sector that are doing things. So maybe we just need to ask the question, if we can get innovation in some aspects of school life that are trying to tackle problems, and okay, it's not having the results we want because we know that school meal uptakes can down for those that are free school meals, but why can't we get that same innovation in other areas? I don't have the answer to it, but I would say that there is innovation out there in schools uh, it's certainly with regard to catering. Uh, Alistair, do you want one minute to reply to this? Uh, I think, well, you know, repeating ourselves and doing the same thing has gone on a lot longer than the last five years. Um, I moved When I moved into an office in Jordan Hill, uh, I found a book that was about 35 years old and it was more choices, more chances for Scotland's youth. So I think we're, we're you know, this is a cycle that just goes on and on. Great, thanks. Okay, that's that's fantastic. Thanks, everybody. We really got a great conversation going. Um, now I'd like to introduce um, our next set of speakers, and of course, a very old um, friends of the network, very old friends of mine uh, from the University of Glasgow, uh, Kevin Loudon and Stuart Hall. Thanks, Raven. Are you happy to share our slides? Yep, or you yep, want me to up now, Kevin. Great, thanks very much. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, that should be it now, yeah. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's great. So I'd like to pick up really nicely dovetails what Alistair was saying there about the, the challenge of you know what we know historically, a lot of school-led interventions, you know, don't seem to have an, an impact. They're not significant, certainly scaling up to make a difference. And issues of evidence and all that, and hopefully touch on that in, in this brief presentation. Uh this approach really grew out of that concern, along with concerns about what schools could do when faced with challenges such as the, the, uh, the attainment gap, poverty related issues, including health and well-being. And in the context that uh, Alistair's neatly summarised there, how do we take back, you know, ownership of this, you know, school led innovations that has a use of appropriate evidence and approaches that can make a difference and and scale them up so that that that, that whole challenge there provides almost an impetus for for this approach i want i'd like to look at so next slide Stephen, please so this approach which we've had in place uh, since chris chapman set up the robert owen center at the university of glasgow we now it's now termed the, the the approach is called the Network for Social and Educational Equity. And in essence, it's a, a, it uses a collaboration and practitioner inquiry approach to help schools and partners understand their context and local issues, which includes understanding issues of poverty, uh, deprivation, health-related issues, and so on, really understanding context and using that information to prioritize their strategies and their curriculum, but also if targeted, you know, hit use the word interventions, but strategies, approaches, trying to think if these are the, the issues that are evidence at all levels and all types of evidence is telling us exist for our children in this context, what would be an appropriate, what can schools do in partnership with other agencies? What would be the appropriate strategies? And some of these, you know, are curtailed by resources, staffing, and so on. But, but within those boundaries, what might be an appropriate uh, way to tackle some of these challenges? And then developing collaboratively and co-producing these strategies with uh, practitioners and drawing on other partners where necessary. And then implementing them. And that might be small scale or it may be across collaborations of schools, which is what we encourage schools working together in clusters across local authorities and more recently across regional improvement collaboratives in the West Partnership, for example. 
and using appropriate evidence, and that includes qualitative indicators, professional judgment, systematic uh, teacher observations, as well as more numerative uh, quantitative indicators, to understand the short term, longer term impacts of these strategies, do they seem to be working? And where they are working, try to embed them in the planning of the schools and the local authorities so they do address that, that challenge that Alistair highlighted about scaling up and embedding. And at the same time, keeping that appropriate reflection and evidence gathering in place to see are they still working and build that culture into a teacher's professional identity. You know, it's, it's, it's what Graham Donaldson talked about you know, such a long time ago. We're trying to make this a feasible approach. So it's a flexible framework, but it uses key principles of collaboration, practitioner research, and really uh, allowing teachers to take ownership of this, working together with colleagues across the system. Next slide, please. And, you know, the evidence for this is international. Uh, and I think the challenge is, you know, we found it, this approach works in different contexts, especially in uh, south of the border. But the key thing is to use it as a framework, but allow teachers to take ownership of it and to decide, you know, with support from our, ourselves in that collaborative process, what is appropriate evidence? How do we use that? How do we use it to form our approaches and, and embed it and build capacity across the system? And we've piloted this in 2013 and developed it across local authorities in Scotland. And, and as I said earlier, in the West Partnership RIC, and even in, in Chile, the, the approach in, in the take up in Chile now, in some of their school uh, districts. And the evidence from what teachers produce as their own research outputs, as well as, as, as our reports and that's in the literature, is, is heartening. But to have real traction on the targets we've talked about today, also links into what uh, Alistair and, and others were talking about, about bringing the community into this process, bringing learners and their families and community and other partner agencies, including third, third sector agents, into this notion of collaboration at the local uh, and, and regional levels, so that they not only inform the strategies, but can help in the, the so-called interventions and approaches. So they're not piecemeal, one-off, you know, lower level experiments, but tries to do its part for and uh, contributing to the system. And it is a challenge, but we believe that we're starting to see cases, you know, of traction and, and uh, where it is making a difference. But it's it's being realistic and saying it is part of a repertoire, part of a strategy of approaches. And I think is there anything I do you want to add to that, Stuart? No, no. Uh, no, I think that was great. Um, I would maybe, I mean, for me, it's just what's key here is data and the ability to, I guess, interrogate your local data. And so that, I guess, you know, part of that empowering process then is that is that teachers and their um, partner agencies stop saying, I think this and begin to say, I know this. So that what they then develop locally is actually grounded in evidence and data. Yeah, and I think that part, you know, the, the, the excellent comment there about, you know, Peth being an example of saying, you know, here's money to, to make a difference, but there's the stringent uh, parameters and they're not always well thought out and even evidence. And this allows teachers to co go back and say, well, we understand appropriate evidence to, to, to be accountable as this, you know, so you're not part of an account, top down accountability driven model, but it's rather teachers saying, look, we can defend what we're doing. Here's what we're doing, here's the evidence it's based on, and here's evidence to show that it's working or it isn't, and so on. So it, that's that's really the, the focus of, of this type of program. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Stuart. Um, let's see if we've got... So, um, does anybody want to see... Um, I'm not seeing anything directly related to this. Um, 
people are, David, what? People are wanting to, if you don't mind, David, um, people are wanting to know about these declining attendance rates, please. Sure. Uh, it's all in the Scottish Attainment Fund evaluation. It's, I think that's now in its fourth year, and it's marked within there that the uh, areas of uh, greatest deprivation have uh, declining attendance rates over, over that period of time. It's also tied into another aspect would be that uh, in that period of time as well, there's increasing numbers of children going to special education. Uh, so there's a sort of uh, double whammy in there. And the poverty research was mentioned, uh, and recently they looked at uh, Fife and increasing numbers on flexible packages. So within the, the system, there's a, 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 a non-participation, but there's also a, a shifting of, of kids out of uh, the mainstream into flexible packages and special schools. Thanks, David. That's really helpful. Um, any comment quickly, Kevin, to that? No, I think it's, it's, it just shows you the degree of the complexity. Uh, and, and things like attendance, use of local data. I think this is where that working closely with uh, local authority colleagues who monitor changes in attendance and, and other patterns and working closely with colleagues in schools and these other partner agencies to, to, to see shifts like that. So really understand, as Stuart said, what's, what's going on? What's at the heart of that? Why is that happening? You know, how does uh, poverty intersect here? And, and then again, try to develop appropriate responses to it. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I think we'll move on to our final set of speakers, and then uh, we, we'll just have time to open up the floor because we need to finish at five on the dot. So our fifth input, um, I hope you've found that the, the inputs as rich and informative as I have. Um, we've got Archie Graham and Kirsten Darling McQuiston from the University of Aberdeen, widening example spaces for preparing new teachers for inclusion. And I'll just share the screen, Archie. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Just tell me when you want me to move the slides. Yeah, I'll do, thank you. So in this uh, short presentation, Kristen and I will report from a study into how university-based uh, teacher educators prepare new teachers to support all learners, uh, including those experiencing poverty and disadvantage. The main idea we present here in relation to widening the example spaces is part of a larger study into how teacher educators enact key messages from inclusive pedagogy in and for uh, initial teacher education. Could we move on, please, Stephen? Thank you. So the rationale uh, informing uh, our work is based on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child which presents an ongoing challenge for teacher educators to, to prepare new and existing teachers to address the rights of increasingly diverse categories of learners. In Scotland, the national framework for inclusion was developed to support consistent approaches to the promotion of inclusion across Scotland's ITE providers. Uh, this national framework for inclusion was developed by the Scottish Universities Inclusion Group, uh, and this is a working group of the Scottish Council of Deans of Education and is representation from all of Scotland's schools of education. Uh, currently, this group is undertaking a mapping project uh, to provide a comprehensive picture uh, of inclusive pedagogy and in initial teacher education across uh, the Scottish uh, schools of education. And throughout Scotland, the National Framework for Inclusion provides this guide for university-based teacher educators to support student teachers to work inclusively with diverse groups of learners, including those from our low socioeconomic backgrounds. And as part of the University Inclusion Group mapping exercise, we discovered that some tutors were creating what they refer to as new spaces for student teachers to think about inclusion and how to enact change. So this discovery sort of promote, prompted further research to explore more fully what the tutors understood these so-called new spaces to be. So here we're just gonna report on one key finding using illustrative examples from a case study or from one of the, the, the tutors. 
Thanks, Archie, and this slide's perfect, Stephen. Uh, the illustrative examples we present here from the case study of one tutor helped us to surface a way of working which the tutor believed supported the development of different approaches by involving the student teachers and tutors in the co-construction of what they call a landscape. The landscape is based on three theoretical perspectives associated with the tutor's subject specialism. And the tutor believes that the recognising the difference in how this curricular subject can be taught via the co-construction of a landscape supports student teachers to think more broadly about differences. For example, the, the tutor stated, and I quote, Student teachers build on the landscape bit by bit. It is quite important to have at least three different perspectives so the students get a sense of a wider landscape. To try and get them to think more broadly that there are differences and different approaches out there and they have different strengths and different weaknesses. However, the tutor explained that this way of working with different perspectives is challenging for student teachers who can perceive difference negatively. The tutor, quote, uh, the tutor claimed, and I quote, it's hard for them because there's a lot there to get their heads around. It lets them start thinking that different people say different things and they're not arguing with one another. There's just different ways of thinking about what we do. Importantly for the tutor, the selection of the different viewpoints on their curricular subjects allows for a widening of the example space within the curricular landscape for the student teachers. The tutor clarified. So I would talk about the example space. They need to have at least three different perspectives and they need to have enough space between them. The tutor is clear that this is not about tutors modeling or privileging one particular approach. The tutor asserted, and I quote again, it's not modeling. I'm not a great fan of people talking about teacher education as modeling. For this tutor, different perspectives on the subject taught are used to widen the example space and that widening the example space provides opportunity for student teachers to recognise and appreciate diversity and different ways of thinking. Final slide please Stephen. So providing different perspectives on a subject may come as little surprise given the tutor is working in a university setting. However, the idea for us of widening the example space is by involving student teachers in the co-construction of a landscape offers more in terms of how we might support student teachers to respond to learner differences, including those learners um, experiencing poverty and disadvantage. So for us, these insights generated some reflective questions that we'd like to share with you. Whose and what types of examples should teacher ed educators engage with? Is the current example space sufficiently rich to prepare teachers for working in high poverty school contexts? What type of examples are necessary to support student teachers to better understand and be able to enact inclusion in high poverty school environments? So we'd welcome further discussion around these questions or any further comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was that was really interesting. Okay, um, folks, we've got we've got about eight nine minutes left. So um, okay, so there's a couple of questions here about evidence. Uh, there's a few folk have maybe argument on the chat line. If you'd like to open it up, John McKendrick, I'm mute. Sorry, I, th I just thought that the, the line of argument um, that, that Kevin was, was, was putting forward was slightly different to that of Tracy and Alistair. There's been some clarification there, uh, I think, in response to that there. It seemed to me that the, what Kevin was arguing is we need evidence, and we need evidence in that demonstrates impact, whereas I think Tracy, in a response in the first question, said, look, well, actually, we need a little bit of trust in here. And that seemed to be the line of argument from Alistair as well, is that it's not that evidence isn't important, is that you know trusting people to make the right decisions is as important but there have been some clarification there by, by kevin uh, explaining that when he's talking about the need for evidence to, it's in a context of trust as well yeah. so okay tracy would you agree with that sure absolutely i think that wider approach is definitely the way to go built on that okay yeah. uh, 
we've, 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 we've got um, Donna Louise Hurrell. Do you want to talk, Donna Louise? Um, yeah, I guess just from my perspective, um, I've got an interesting background because I came from research in economic inclusion, employability, regeneration into teaching. And I found that quite a lot of times when I've looked at possibly trying to introduce something or talking about how, how things are influenced, the understanding of what generates evidence and how you can demonstrate impact among sort of local authority education departments and among other teachers is very, very limited. So that prevents them from taking any risk in any sorts of interventions. Whereas a researcher, we have a much more wider definition of what can constitute evidence and how we can go about gathering evidence, but that just isn't there in education. Well, I haven't found it to be there in education. And that's really one of the, the big barriers is that they don't understand what what constitutes evidence so it, yeah. it actually just prevents a lot of risks from taking yeah. that's my perspective so right. far anyway. that's, that's really helpful um, Stuart would you want to respond to that well I mean I think it's a fair point I mean certainly in our experience over the uh you know since we, we've kind of set up the network and, and we've spoke to lots of teachers in lots of schools and and there is that kind of well unless you're doing big numbers and big percentages it's not legitimate somehow. And of course, we're, I guess, the other way saying, well, actually, it's got to be horses for courses. What's appropriate for the issues? Um, so that, that I guess there is a bit of kind of education there just to help people realise that actually some qualitative methods are perfectly appropriate and probably the appropriate way for doing, you know, some of the research. And for so many of our schools, as the old saying goes, there's too many variables. So let's now start the numbers straight off. So yeah, absolutely, I go with that point. Yeah, I, I, Alistair, I'd like to hear your opinion on this because you spent a lot of time working in Spring Run Academy, um, doing various things. What, what's your take on this? Um, I think the, you know, for me, the, the idea that uh, if you take somewhere like Springburn where, you know, when we first started there quite a long time ago now, nobody had, had become a doctor in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, you know, there's some schools in Glasgow which have more people in the fast track for doing medicine and for the early application to UCAS than what other schools will send in entirety into higher education. You know what I mean? So they could have 20 or 30 kids wanting to do medicine in the year, um, whereas other schools will have 10 going to university. So I think looking at that problem and seeing it as something that can be fixed by an intervention or, you know, randomized control trial or some sort of articulation of evidence and research and, and working like that, I think it's just wrong. You know, we need to think much more broadly about society and the issues and the inequality that we have and how we might be able to address that. Okay. I don't is. want that to mean, I mean, I don't think that's impossible. I think there are ways of doing that, but at the moment we don't, we don't focus like that. Okay, Archie and Kirsten, what, what's your take on this, this discussion about evidence? I think, I, mean, I think it's really difficult for teachers to be quite honest with you because I think I mean it's, it's the age-old issue of time you know to, fill, you know, to, to engage with you know you know and identify the research and what and, and what's there and I, and, and I and I think that this there does need to be a bit more kind of scope and understanding of the complexities of teaching particularly in these uh, high poverty context environments because often from from our work we see is that you know the job of the teacher goes way beyond you know what what's happening in maybe more kind of affluent areas you know and the type of work that they're doing so i i think you know that you know that there's the support for the teachers in that in, that, in those particular environments that, to help them you know identify what constitutes evidence in that context yeah great Archie. Kirsten, do you want to add anything do you know i don't think there's anything more to add to that i i think context is key and support yeah. and creating an environment where people feel confident to tell their stories and that those, those yeah. stories are valued yeah and, and zoe thompson's saying something very similar thanks so, john i'm going to ask you a question now from david watts again um is there a difference in local solutions against regional or national or global solutions here's an easy one for you john First of all, I need to apologise for David for mistyping a response. For I don't know if anybody followed the chat, but basically earlier on it looked as if I said, I'm not interested 
in, uh, in attendance. But what I, what I meant to say was I am now interested. So <laughs> uh, just to make that clear, I'm not some stroppy get. <laughs> you are a stroppy get, on with it. So yeah, the, the local, national, or, or, or global. I mean, I don't know to be honest. Is, is the quick answer to that again? Interest in regard to school meals. And sorry for for you just sticking with us. That we've got a webinar next week, which is a, a, a as an international seminar looking at USA and Scotland and bringing together the joint experiences and trying to learn from each other. Very different context in terms of the cities, the cultures, but they still believe that there's room for learning from each other there. So it's not necessarily there's a global solution to what the problems we face in Scotland, but there are maybe aspects of what's going on there that we can work our way through and adapt. So I'd like to think we'd be open-minded in Scotland, both in terms of learning from abroad, but I, I do get the point we need to, to apply that sensitively. And some sort of cack handed belief in um, what works can transfer, you know, everywhere, absolute nonsense. And we should, we should never allow ourselves as critical researchers to kind of fall into that way of thinking. Great, thank you very much, John. That's that's a, a, a great note uh, on which to kind of start winding up. Um, I, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers who gave the input, uh, and thank you to all of you who've come along this afternoon and uh, who participated. It was getting kind of lively there, which was terrific. But the good news is that we're up, we're we're having another event uh, in two weeks' time on the 18th. Uh, we only have four inputs at that point, uh, so it means we'll have more time for discussion and that the details of that will be issued on uh, the CIRA, Facebook, the Twitter, um, and you'll be able to register for that almost immediately because I think, Angela, you've, you've, you've arranged all the details. Yes, Angela? It's live and it's now bookable, so you should be able to go into any of the CIRA um, resources and be able to book away. Brilliant, brilliant. And our third event will be on the 20th of May. Uh, all the events are between four and five. And with e enormous pleasure, we'll be welcoming Professor Chris Chapman and Alison Drever, who will be coming along uh, at that point. And if we get time, we'll squeeze another one in in June. Uh, but we hope you can come in two weeks' time. Um, slight different set of speakers. And uh, unfortunately, John will be chairing that. So no doubt we'll be getting lots of yellow and red cards from the ex-SBFL referee. Um, hope you can come. We'll be looking at things like digital exclusion. We'll be looking, uh, picking up some, some other aspects of the work that Alistair is undertaking with Katie Hunter in the University of Strathclyde. Uh, we'll be looking at young carers and we'll also be returning to the University of Aberdeen to get another perspective on some of the work they're doing. Really hope you can, you can join us at that stage. Uh, thank you so much for coming. And the final thing, is the adverts, of course. Thank you so much. And if you would like to join CIRA, please have a look on social media and, and the web page. And also keep an eye out because the, the CIRA Connect events are happening throughout the month of March. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you in two weeks time. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. Bye.